20, <clears throat> Acts chapter 20. I always appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak the, uh, from the Word of God. And Acts chapter 20, we're going to start reading in verse uh, 17. Acts chapter 20, in verse 17. But before we read these verses, I want to ask you a very spiritual but an important question. How's your joy? How's your joy? And you see, the Bible clearly commands us to have joy. But you see, we cannot produce this joy in and of ourselves. This joy can only be produced through God, through the Holy Spirit. And the Bible also commands us to walk in the Spirit. And you see, when we are walking in the Spirit, we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith. You see, you and I are commanded to have joy. That's the thing that we are commanded to have. But why would we want to live a life without the joy that the Lord can give us? You see, a lot of us think that joy and happiness are the same thing, but they're not. There are two totally different things. Happiness um, comes from the word happenstance. And it means that when circumstances come in our life that we want, we're happy about it. But when circumstances come in our life that we don't want, we become sad or angry or bitter about that situation. So you see, happiness can come and go, but joy is totally different. You see, our joy comes from the Lord. This joy is a divine joy. It's a joy that only God can give us. It's different from happiness. And you see, this joy, God has given us a divine ability to have joy. That's why our joy only comes from the Lord, because He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's why when our joy is in the Lord, it's consistent. Happiness comes and goes, but when our joy is in the Lord, it'll be consistent. But I wanted us to look at Acts chapter 20, and I want us to see how Paul has this heaven-sent joy, this divine joy that only God can give us. Acts chapter 20, and we're going to start reading in verse 17. <clears throat> the Word of God says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came unto Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations, <clears throat> which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this church has been doing since the day it started. It's testifying both to the, to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, and now knowing the thing that shall befall me there, save the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abid me. But none of these things move me, neither count on my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy, and at the and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that ye all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dearly Father, we thank you so much. For today, we thank you for the opportunity to be able to come and worship you. I do pray and ask, O oh Lord, that yeah, you would take me and use me as your preacher boy. May you just allow us to leave church tonight closer to you than when we came. And we just ask all this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. As we're looking at this passage, many of us know Paul. We've heard many stories about Paul. We've, we've read many accounts of Paul. I believe Paul is one of the greatest missionaries that has ever lived on this earth. He was used by God to do many things. And we see Paul says in chapter 24 that he wants to finish his course with joy. You see, Paul was not looking to create a fan base. He wasn't looking to try and get a following. He wasn't trying to get people to recognize him. He wasn't trying to uh, win recognition in people's eyes. No, Paul was on a mission, and his mission was to finish his course with joy. He was on a mission to finish the course that God had given him 
with joy. And Paul had gone through so many things. I was just thinking about all the things Paul has gone through. He went through shipwrecks. He was stoned for preaching the gospel. He was bitten by a snake. He was beaten. He was tortured. He was thrown into prison. All these different things Paul went through because he wanted to finish his course with joy. And I love what he says in verse 24. He says that I want to finish my course with joy. Paul knew what was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. It, it wasn't something that he didn't think was going to happen. Verse 23 even says that, he, that in every city there was bonds and afflictions. That means wherever Paul went, he was either beaten up, tortured, or thrown into prison. So this was not something uncommon to Paul. He knew that when he went to Jerusalem, something bad was going to happen because he was sharing the gospel. So Paul knew where he was going. He knew what was going to happen. And many of us know after he's taken uh, by the Jews, he's then sent to Rome. And from Rome, that is where Paul lives his last days. And he's executed there in Rome. So this is Paul's last time here on earth. But he says, I want to finish my course with joy. If there is ever a time in America where God's people need to say, listen, I know that we're living in a crazy world. I know that we don't understand what our world is trying to do. Sometimes it boggles us what in, what in the world's happening. But we need to say, listen, we have a heaven-sent joy. Yeah. A joy that changes lives. Amen. A joy that changes everything. Amen. That's the kind of joy that we have. Amen. And I wonder, when people look at your life, would they be able to say, I want what he has? I want what she has. I want that joy. Would people be able to say that when they look at your life? So this evening, I want us to see three keys that we can find from verse 24 about having this heaven-sent joy. The first key is get your eyes off of your circumstances. Get your eyes off of your circumstances. We see in verse 24, actually let's start in verse 22. It says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there. We see here it is a situation where Paul does not know what is going to happen. He is wondering, uh, am I going to be beaten? Am I going to be thrown into prison? Paul does not know. He probably knows he's going to have some type of difficulty, but he doesn't know what's going to happen later on, that he's going to be sent to Rome, and he'll be executed there for his faith in God. But there's some uncertainty in verse 22. But 23, it says, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Like I said before, Paul realizes, you know, uh, the Spirit has, has showed me that in every city I've gone to, people don't like me. They don't like that I'm preaching the gospel. They don't like that I'm speaking that Jesus is the only way to heaven. They don't like that I'm saying that Jesus is God's son, and he's been beaten and mocked He's been tortured, thrown into prison, all these different things. But I love what he says at the beginning, verse 24. He says, but none of these things move me. And I thought, wow, Paul was not concentrating on his circumstances. He knew what was going to happen. He knew he was probably going to be beaten. He knew he was going to be thrown into prison. <clears throat> he knew that there was probably a whole list of different things that could happen to him. But he wasn't concerned about that. He said, none of these things move me. He didn't care if he was shipwrecked. He didn't care if he was beaten. He didn't care if he was tortured. He didn't care if they threw him in prison and he never got to see the sunlight again. He just knew that I'm on a mission to finish my course with joy. And if you want to finish your course with joy, you have to stop looking at your circumstances and you have to start looking at the Lord. You have to stop looking at everything that's going wrong in your life and you have to stop, start looking at the Lord. Because like I said, He's the only one can, that can produce that joy, that heaven-sent joy. Here's one thing that we can do in any situation that we're in. And it's from the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It says, in everything, give thanks. In everything, give thanks. And I began thinking about that. And I, I reminded myself of Paul and Silas when they were beaten and thrown into prison. And I know that they were singing praises to the Lord, but I believe while they were singing praises, they were probably thanking the Lord for all that he's done. Maybe they were thanking the Lord for saving their life. They'd beaten them, but they hadn't killed them. Maybe they were praising the Lord for those that got saved that day before they were thrown into prison. I have no idea, but I began thinking about that. They began praising and thanking 
the Lord. And because they did that, the Lord allowed an earthquake to come. Chains fell off. The prison doors opened up. And that's when they got this wonderful opportunity to share the gospel with this Philippian jailer. And I began thinking in my own life, how many times have I missed an opportunity to share the gospel or to be a blessing to someone else because I was too busy complaining about my circumstance instead of thanking the Lord for the circumstance. I think so many times we go through things and instead of thanking God for the circumstance, we complain about it. I don't know about you, but if I'll be honest with you, I feel a lot of the times like I'm just like the Israelites. And if you're being honest, you are just like the Israelites. God blesses us. God brings us through things. God helps us out. But instead of us thanking the Lord for that, instead of us saying, thank you, Lord, for that situation, thank you for allowing me to be able to go through that, and now I can help somebody else. No, instead, we always find the one thing that we can complain about. God, why did you allow this happen to me? God, I didn't deserve this, or that person didn't deserve this. And we always seem to find that one thing to complain about instead of thanking the Lord for the million other things that he's done for us. And I think that's so important to getting your eyes off the circumstances is being thankful. If we were more thankful, we would stop focusing on the circumstances and we would start focusing on all the good things God has done for us. Because if we're truly honest, we are a blessed nation and we are a blessed people. There's so many things we can be thankful for, but so often we're too consumed on our circumstances on our situations. And we see here's Paul. I don't think any of us are in the same situation that Paul is in. None of us are uh, planning to go somewhere where we're going to be beaten, where we're going to be tortured and thrown into prison. All of us are living a blessed life. But here's Paul. He knows all these things are going to happen to him. But he says, none of these things move me. I wonder tonight, would you be able to say that same thing? No matter what circumstances I'm going through, none of these things move me because I want to have this heaven sent joy and you see when we get our eyes off of the Lord off of the circumstances and we put them on the Lord like I said before he's the same yesterday today and forever and when our eyes are on the Lord our joy is going to be consistent so make sure that you're getting your eyes off of the circumstance and onto the Lord that's the first key the second key is be willing to serve. If we look at verse 24 again, it says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus. You see, joy always comes by serving. And we should love to serve because there's joy in serving other people. Sometimes people are like, Well, I don't really like serving other people because they don't really appreciate when I serve them. Maybe you're serving in the church and and you, you don't feel like somebody thanks you for that service. But can I remind you, we don't serve for people, we serve for the Lord. And that's something I've had to remind myself many times. Because as people, we want people to recognize us when we're serving. We want people to say, man, good job, you did a great job, proud of you. But you see, we don't serve for people to do that. It's nice when they do that, but we serve for the Lord. And we're serving others because God has commanded us to serve others, not because others tell us good job or thank you for serving me. We serve others because we're supposed to. And I began thinking about when I was a young boy, when I was six or seven years old, I used to love going on visitation or door to door with my dad. And we used to live in Africa. I I would try my best to dress up just like my dad. I'd try and find the same pair of pants he was wearing, the same shirt. I'd try and brush my hair just like he did. Try and find the same shoes if I had them, you know. I, was a little, I had a lot smaller foot than he did, so I didn't always have the same shoe. But I tried to dress up just like him, and I was his little buddy. I went everywhere with him. I would go on visitation with him, and I would sit there, and I would listen to him as he shares the gospel with people. And there was this one gentleman that we'd often pass by as we went to different villages to go on door-to-door. And this man was known in the town for being a drunk and a smoker. And there, in Ghana, they'd look down on all that stuff. You can be beaten and all that kind of things for doing that stuff. So everybody in town knew him to be that kind of man. And everybody told my dad, don't bother spending time with him. Don't bother trying to witness to him. He's never going to trust in Jesus Christ. And every time we passed by there, my dad would say, I need to witness to that man. 
And finally, my, my dad said, you know, I'm, I'm going to listen to the Lord instead of listening to everybody else. And he got this man some food, and he gave him a New Testament Bible. And he didn't say much to him, but he said, I want you to know that Jesus loves you. And I can remember this like it was yesterday. A few days later, it was Sunday morning, and I'm sitting in the front row waiting for my dad to get up and start the service. And this man that my dad witnessed to just a couple days ago comes in. He tried to dress the best that he could, and he came running up to my dad, and he said, I just wanted to tell you something. He said, that Bible you gave me, he said, I smoked Matthew, I smoked Mark, and I smoked Luke, but John smoked me. <laughs> because he used to use them to smoke cigarettes. And he said, I got gloriously saved. And we were all rejoicing with this man because he's been saved. And still to this day, he is serving in our church in Amen. Ghana, West Africa. Amen. So it was a blessing to see how this man, even though nobody thought he could get saved, even though nobody wanted to give him the time of day, somebody gave him, um, somebody shared the gospel with him. Somebody decided to go out of their way and to serve him, to give him just a little bit of the joy of Jesus Christ. And because they did that, he got saved. Amen. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because so often in our lives, we miss the opportunity to serve others because we're so consumed about them not recognizing us or people not recognizing what we're doing. Instead, we just need to serve the Lord Amen. and he'll bless us. Amen. Serve the Lord and he'll bless us. So I want you to see the first key is to get your eyes off of your circumstances. The second key is be willing to serve. And the last is testify of the Lord. Testify of the Lord. Verse 24 says, But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. You see, there's no better time to witness to people than right now. Amen. Paul was ready to witness to people. And the end of verse 24, he said, I'm ready to testify of the gospel to other people. That's what Paul was saying. And, and I love this part because I was, I was reading this, this book. I got to chapter 21 and I kept reading. And I want you to see what Paul does. He doesn't just mention how he wants to testify of the Lord. He actually does it. And chapter 21, if you look in verse 33... The word of God says, Then the chief captain came near and took him and commanded him to be bound with two chains and, de and demanded who he was and what he had done. At this point in time, Paul is now in Jerusalem. He's preaching the word of God. And now these, uh, these Romans have captured him. And some cried one thing and one another among the multitudes. And when he could not know the certainty of the tumult, he commanded him to be carried into the castle. And when he came upon the stairs, so it was that he was born of the soldiers for the violence of the people. For the multitude of the people followed after, crying, Away with him. And as Paul was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee? Who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness four thousand men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarshish, the city in Cilicia, a citizen of the mean city, and I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Verse 40, And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with the hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in Hebrew tongue, saying, And I wish we had time to read all of chapter 22, because that's where it gets really exciting. But in short... Paul gives his salvation testimony. He starts saying, listen, I was just like you. I hated God. I hated the things of God. I hated people. I even crucified them. I even killed different people because they believed in Jesus Christ. But he said, listen, there was one day I was on my way to Damascus and God stopped me. He said, God got a hold of my life. In verse 7, he, ever, he even says that Paul call, God called out to me and said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, God forever changed my life. And he can change your life too if you believe in him. You see, Paul wasn't just saying, hey, I want to testify of the Lord. He did it. And I wonder this evening, is there somebody that you know that loves the Lord because you told them? 
Is there someone today that you know that loves the Lord because you told them? Paul was willing to go to the ends of the earth to tell people about Jesus. He was even on his way to probably be beaten up and thrown into prison, but he wanted to tell those Jews who had just allowed him to go to prison about the one person that can save them from their sins. And I think that's so important to realize is that we must always be willing to testify of the Lord. And I think so often we belittle our testimonies. But here's Paul, one of the greatest missionaries who probably could have given a great message about salvation. But instead, he gave his testimony. And he said, listen, I was just like you, but God changed my life. And he can change your life. Let's never stop being a testimony for the Lord. Let's keep testifying what God has done in our lives. As we started this new year, I thought, what greater way for us to apply this, um, this goal that Paul had in his life, to finish my course with joy. And I wonder this evening if we could make this same goal, this, this same maybe New Year's resolution to say, and say, Lord, I want to finish my course with joy. I know that maybe you are coming soon. Maybe it's in a year, maybe it's in two years, maybe it's tomorrow, I don't know, but I want to finish my course with joy. I want to be like Paul and finish my course with joy. This will only happen when we first get our eyes off of our circumstances and we will put them on the Lord because he's the only one that can give us that kind of joy. Then secondly, we must be willing to serve others, not being so consumed about ourselves or so consumed that people recognize what we're doing, but just being willing to serve others. And then lastly, we must testify what God has done for us. Testify to others what God has done for you. There's no greater time to witness than now. There are so many people that want the joy that you have. Be that witness. Be that testimony and say, look at what God has done in my life. So I ask you again, how is your joy?